Hello everyone, hope everybody's doing okay. This has been a very unusual week, right, to say the least. And I think for us as One Piece fans, it actually started around Monday or Tuesday where there were rumors floating around about Oda's health. We were supposed to be getting chapter 992 this week, but unfortunately Oda got sick. So instead we got an announcement stating that we would be getting a two week break and that chapter 992 would officially be released on Friday, October 16th. And all of this kind of developed on the heels of Oda announcing in the previous issue that he would actually be aiming to reach chapter 1000 of One Piece by the end of the year. So now that goal is super unlikely, uh, but that doesn't matter. Like, you know, the most important thing is his health. Fortunately, from what I understand and from what I read, Oda is doing better now. So hopefully he had enough time to take it easy or to take it easier. And the reason we know that Oda is doing better is because they actually announced a return date for the series. So if Oda wasn't feeling better, they, they wouldn't say like when the series would be back. They would just probably say something like, One Piece is going on indefinite hiatus or temporary hiatus. But because we actually got a return date for October 16th, then that means that Oda is doing a lot better. So that's great news. You know, I wish him the best. I wish all of you the best. You and everyone, I wish you great health. We still don't know uh, what Oda was sick of. Uh, so those details still haven't been disclosed, but regardless, you know, I'm, I'm, we're all glad. I think we're all glad as a community that he's feeling better now. So without further ado, let's get into this week's topic. Today we're going to be talking about the current user of the OP OP no Mi Trafalgar D water law, because there seems to be a consensus that it's very likely that law will meet his end during this arc of Wano. So I'm actually going to start off with the reasons for why it's likely that law will sacrifice himself by the end of the arc. But then by the end, I'm going to throw a wrench in my own gears through a curveball and actually bring up a major reason that actually makes it less likely that Law could die. It'll be in the form of a question rather than in the form of an argument. It's a point that I haven't seen a lot of people make, and I think it's important to address this point if, if we believe that Law is in fact going to die in Wano. Because if we can't come up with a proper answer to what I will be asking, then it probably means that Law is going to survive Wano and that he is in fact safe. But first let's start off with evidence that points to Law's demise. So if you remember before the start of Wano, Kaido became aware via the news that the two main players responsible for messing up his trade deal with Dofi were Luffy and Law. So Kaido knows that Law played a part in messing up his plans. And then if you remember shortly after Kaido one-shots Luffy, he flies away as a dragon and says, I'll get Trafalgar Law next which still hasn't happened yet because Law and Kaido haven't actually met face to face. But given that this is what Kaido did to Kid and this is what Kaido did to Luffy, I think it's obvious that Kaido intends to do the same thing to Law. Now Kid and Luffy actually had days to recover from their injuries. And the unfortunate reality is that Law won't have that time because we're already in the middle of the fight. We're in the middle of the raid, so there's not a whole lot of time where Law could rest if he gets injured as badly as Kid and Luffy did. Also, there are certain techniques that Law can use with the Opi Opi no Mi that require the exchange of his lifespan to use them. Like there's a scene in Dressrosa where Law says that he actually shortened his life to be able to make a room that's bigger than normal so that he can land a hit on Doflamingo. So if he spams those rooms against Kaido, it's gonna add up. Now to go back even further, Oda had Law be the one who originally proposed the idea to Luffy that they should team up to try and take down Kaido. Granted, Law mainly said this because his real target was Doflamingo and he wanted to take down Dofi instead of Kaido, but regardless, Oda made him say it, and here we are, boys and girls, here we are. In other words, Law kinda has like some share of the responsibility for sending Luffy down this post-time skip rabbit hole that ultimately led us to Wano. Now thematically, if you look at Law's past, his flashback, there's a theme that repeats itself over and over again, which is that Law doesn't feel free. Because as a kid, he lived with two issues that tied him down. The first is that he was born in a country that was exploited and then later eradicated by the world government. 
because the world government found white lead in the country and they knew, the world government knew that the white lead was poisonous, but because they were making so much money from selling off the white lead products, the world government allowed the workers of Flavance to continue to dig up the poisonous material without telling them that it was poisonous. Then after people started getting really sick, they blocked off the country from the rest of the world and the citizens that tried to sneak out of the country to find treatment would be shot. So of course the violence escalates and Flavance is destroyed. Law is there when the extermination takes place and the only reason he was able to survive was because he sneaked out, he crossed the border in hiding. And the theme of closed borders is actually a very big theme in Wano. Remember, the whole goal, the established goal by Odin was to open up the borders of Wano country. So thematically, as an arc, Wano fits Law's character very well because Law understands the perils, the dangers of a closed off country. Not only that, but if you remember, before Odin died, he actually revealed that the reason for why Wano was closed off in the first place was to protect itself from an enemy. And I think, I think it's very, very obvious that that enemy that Wano is trying to protect itself from is the world government. And so if Law finds out that the reason for why Wano is closed off is the exact same reason for why Flevance ended up being shut off from the rest of the world, which is the world government, I think it makes it more likely for him to support the cause and even lay down his life to open up those borders. And then the second thing that was tying Law down back when he was a kid was his health, right? His short life expectancy. In fact, Corazon's final words to Law is him saying, you are now free, Law. Like nothing will limit you anymore, whether it be the iron fence of Flavance, the border of Flavance, or your health, you are free. And so the theme of health is also part of the Wano arc because you have characters like Queen the Plague who is creating diseases and spreading them to people. And then you also have people who have eaten smile devil fruits that can't even grieve, they can't even show their emotions because of a side effect of the smile devil fruit. And so I think that has to be resolved. Uh, I mainly see either Chopper or Law resolving the, the smiley side effect but regardless, like if that gets resolved, I think it would it would also make for a very good conclusion for Law's character arc. In fact, if Law dies, I think that would give Chopper that push that he's needed ever since the time skip because Chopper has been kind of neglected as a character since the time skip. So if Law dies, I think that would just serve to inspire Chopper even further and, and just increase the urgency of Chopper actually going to Laugh Tale and say, okay, you know, I really need to find out how to cure every disease. So you would kind of end up with a scenario of Chopper inheriting Law's will as a doctor. And then we also have the whole thing about Law being a D and how we've seen several Ds sacrifice their life for other people. Like Ace sacrificed himself for Luffy, right? Uh, Rogue, uh, Ace's mom, sacrificed herself for Ace. Saul sacrificed himself for Robin. Uh, personally, I think, I, I said this a long time ago, but I think that Roger actually sacrificed himself for Shanks. I think that the disease that Roger had was because he did something uh, to save Shanks and he had to, that was the exchange, right? His health uh, to save Shanks. So I think Roger saved Shanks' life and I think he ended up getting sick because he saved Shanks. Because if you remember in chapter 968, when Roger comes back from Laugh Tale, we get a shot of Shanks crying on Roger. And so I think the reason for why Shanks is crying is because the expectation was that they were going to find a cure in Laugh Tale for Roger's illness, and that was not the case. But even if that didn't happen, I think you could still make the argument that Roger kind of gave himself up, sacrificed himself to start the new pirate age. So if you follow the will of D, to me it makes perfect sense that somebody like Law, who is also a D, would end up sacrificing himself for somebody else, especially if that somebody else happens to be Luffy. Now, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the idea that Law will die by performing the eternal youth surgery on Luffy after Kaido wrecks Luffy, because I think for the most part, that's a very popular theory. It's been done to death, and I think it's very well accepted. I think we're all pretty much aware that that's a very strong possibility that that could happen. So instead, I want to talk about the possibility that the favor that Kaido owes Big Mom 
is that maybe at one point in the past, Big Mom helped Kaido, he got him out of a tight spot by providing him the immortality of the Opi Opi no Mi. In chapter 987, Kaido alludes to a fight that he was about to lose, and he says, Pirates will betray you. When they know that you will lose, they will abandon you and sail away. So maybe Kaido lost a fight back then, and it was so bad that he was near death, and then maybe Big Mom showed up with the Opi Opi no Mi user, and that person was forced to perform the immortality surgery on Kaido. Also, I know there's technically a rule about Big Mom not being able to put souls into either corpses or other human beings, but because she can like take away, remove the lifespan from another human being, I started thinking like, what if she removed the eternal lifespan from the person who had gotten the surgery previously, right? What if she took out the eternal lifespan from that person and then found a way of giving that eternal lifespan to Kaido so that he wouldn't die. Like maybe that's the favor that she was talking about. Anyway, Kaido being immortal would kind of serve to give more depth to a dialogue line that Big Mom has when she's talking to Kaido via Denden Mushi, which is that she essentially tells him that the debt or the favor that he owes her is a lifelong debt. Now, if Kaido is actually immortal, then lifelong means an eternal debt. So maybe Big Mom was talking in code here. Now, in addition, Kaido being immortal would also serve to explain why he cannot die no matter how hard he tries. And it would also serve to answer the question about why it is that if Kaido really wants to die, why doesn't he just throw himself into the water? Well, if Kaido actually had the special surgery performed on him, even if he fell into the water, he would probably just end up like Jack. So Kaido wouldn't really be able to drown because the immortality effect or the eternal life effect from the surgery would still be active even underwater. Now, just because Kaido can't die doesn't mean that he can't be injured. In fact, I think that in order to remove the immortality from Kaido's body, the supernova, mainly Luffy, is going to have to break his will first. And so the supernova are gonna have to find a way of dealing enough damage to Kaido to break his will, which by the way, that's something that Kaido like does to other people, right? He, he wants to break their will. So the Supernova Alliance is gonna have to find a way of dealing enough damage to Kaido so that Law can get in there by the end and extract Kaido's immortality from his body because it's not something that Kaido is just gonna hand over to them, right? In fact, he, he kinda wants a good fight. He yearns for a good challenge. Yeah, that's, that's what he said during his introduction. So they need to deplete slash drain Kaido of his hockey first. And so I actually started thinking about the 11 Supernova, their powers, their abilities, and what they could actually do to try to damage Kaido. Luffy and Zoro are already covered because they can use Ryo to deal damage. We haven't seen Luffy's Gear 5th or his Awakening, and we also haven't seen Zoro's Ashura, so I think once we actually get to see those modes, they'll be used with the incorporation of Ryo as well. If Apu changes his mind and joins the Alliance, as long as Kaido doesn't cover his ears, he should be able to bypass Kaido's external defense with his sound. And he can blast him that way, just like he did with Kizaru. So it's just a matter of catching Kaido off guard so that he's not covering his ears. Which I think Kaido will be caught off guard if Apu decides to betray him mid-battle. Hawkins is interesting because his Devil Fruit allows him to create dolls that can transfer damage. Now we don't know exactly how Hawkins is able to link these dolls to specific people, but we do know that he can produce 10 of them. So all Hawkins needs to do is to connect one of those dolls to Kaido and allow himself to be attacked by somebody else. That way whatever damage Hawkins gets will be transferred directly to Kaido instead. So maybe he'll be able to create 10 dolls that actually all link back to Kaido and that way he can deal 10 hits of damage to Kaido. Also Hawkins has like these booster cards in his deck at one point he did say that as long as you accept the risks, there are cards that will grant you power that will exceed your own limits. So depending on how many booster cards he's able to draw, he can either use the effect on himself or power up another member of the Alliance, like Luffy. Maybe he could even give the power boost to somebody like Killer, 
who is already kind of cursed anyway because of the smile devil fruit that he ate. Plus, Killer would be the one to need the boost the most if he's going to go up against Kaido with the rest of the supernova there. We already know that Drake can use armament hockey because he defeated Caribou in one of the cover stories, and Caribou is a Logia user. And I also keep saying over and over again that in theory, if you're a swordsman, the use of Rio should come a lot easier to you as long as you have the proper sword because the sword helps you channel your hockey outward. In fact, the only reason why Hyogoro knows how to use Ryo is because he is a swordsman. So because Drake is a marine, and we've seen that the admirals can use Ryo, and because Drake is also a swordsman, it would not surprise me at all if it turns out that he can use Ryo as well. He just seems really well trained. Something that I found very interesting is that during Udon, Oda actually decided to remove Kid for a while. Like, he has Kid break out of prison, and then later he's brought back. But what I found was interesting is that he actually removes Kid from that scene right before Luffy begins to learn how to use Ryo. Almost as if Oda was saying, yeah, Kid doesn't really need to learn how to use Ryo. Either that, or Kid has an ace up his sleeve that he can use to, to damage Kaido already. Because portrayal-wise, it's already been established that Luffy and Kid have like this ongoing rivalry with each other. So they seem to be like around the same level. So if Luffy can injure Kaido and, and Kid can't do anything, like if, if Kid can't damage Kaido, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense in terms of the portrayal of their rivalry. So uh, when it comes to Kid's power, which is like electromagnetism, if you notice the way that he uses his power is to either attract or repel things, right? And so I find that interesting because the concept of Rio which by the way, another name for Rio is flow, right? Requires the user to let energy flow out of their bodies. So it's kind of like you're, you're, you're shooting out energy. But if you think about it, like Kid is already doing that because of his power. Electromagnetic energy is constantly flowing in and out of him so that he can manipulate metal. So the fact that he can repel or deflect things is very similar to the concept of Rio already. So it wouldn't be too, I don't, I can't imagine it would be too hard for him to learn how to use Rio if he doesn't already know how to do it. And also in Stampede, we actually saw that Kid does have armament hockey. So you add that to his power and it just kind of makes you know logical sense that Rio would be the next step. But even if he doesn't have Rio because of his power, all right, all he needs to do technically is to get Kaido to ingest, right, some metal, and Kid can deal some really bad damage. Like I was reading this article about little kids accidentally swallowing like little magnet toys. They ended up in the hospital because the magnets were essentially tearing up the kid's digestive tract. And there's also this article I read about how a large enough magnetic field could actually ruin the chemical bonds that give our body its function and structural integrity. So depending on how far Oda is willing to push kid's power, it, it could really mess you up. Also, doesn't Kaido have like a metal club and, and also like metal spiky, cuffs on his hands. I mean, unless those are made out of sea stone, which would be crazy because then that means that Kaido is essentially training himself all the time. But if they're made out of metal, you know, I want Kid to pull a Magneto and just be able to bend Kaido's hands and Kaido's club. Like have Kaido's wrists go like, ah, or just kind of get them to stick in the air like boom, boom. Now, given that Oda didn't show Law being able to use shambles on Dofi to switch Dofi into somebody else's body, I don't think that he's gonna let Law do it to Kaido either. I mean, if Law could do that to Kaido, the possibilities are pretty much endless. But usually the way it works is that if your hockey is stronger than Law's, then you can pretty much block most of Law's abilities or attacks inside of the room. That's why Dofi was able to block Law all over the place in Dressrosa, because Dofi had stronger hockey. Like, the only attacks that Doflamingo couldn't block from Law were his electrical-based attacks, like Counter Shock. But even then, Virgo and Dofi tanked that anyway. So I definitely think Law's best attack to damage Kaido is going to be his Gamma Knife, because that thing hits you from the inside. It's similar to the last level of armament hockey. It's just that Dofi was able to repair himself because of his strings, but Kaido can't do that. So Gamma Knife should be able to deal some damage because it should bypass Kaido's defense. 
either that or Locke could also try using his injection shot, but injection shot is actually like a weaker version of Gamma Knife. And it actually did hit Dofi and went through him. It's just like, it's it's a weaker blow. It's a weaker attack. Now I know Capone, Rouge, and Bonnie are not in this arc. I personally see them showing up in later arcs, but just for fun, I'll talk about them as well. Bonnie, I think is pretty self-explanatory. If she has a good opening, she can turn Kaido into either a toddler or a very old person. And the thing is, is that when she turned the Marines into toddlers and old people, like they were rendered useless because the toddlers wouldn't stop crying and the old people just kept complaining about their health, like back problems and stuff. So depending on how old or how young she makes Kaido, she can leave him very vulnerable to the point where he can't even walk. It's, it's one of the reasons for why I think she's not in this arc is because her fruit is really broken. And I know she lost to Blackbeard, but I think it's important to remember that Blackbeard has the power to absorb devil fruit powers. So she probably couldn't use her powers on him like she would be able to do with Kaido. Now, when it comes to Capone, it depends on what type of ammo he uses. Like if he finds the right opening and times it right, he could try using the KX launcher again and see if that works. Uh, Capone also has a sea stone spear that he keeps around, so he might be able to use that as well. But personally, I'd be more interested in him getting his hands on Queen's plague bullets and have him fire that on Kaido, because those bullets work by infecting your skin and drying you up until you're shriveled. And then finally, we have Mad the Monk. Urouge ate a devil fruit that allows him to take damage and convert that damage into attack power. It's called Karma Exposure slash Retribution. So it's similar to Hawkins in that all he needs to do is to be able to absorb damage without being knocked out, and then he can give that damage back and aim it at Kaido. Now, the reason for why this technique didn't work on Cracker and Cracker defeated Urouge is because Cracker's defense is way higher than his attack power. So even though Mad the Monk absorbed the damage from Cracker's attacks, the retribution wasn't strong enough to overpower Cracker's defense. And so that's why it didn't work. So Uruja's ability is better suited for opponents that have a high attack power, but a lower defense, or an attack power that is higher than their defense stats, which could be Kaido's case. And I can definitely imagine a scene where the supernova work together to take down Kaido, and they have him on the ground, right? Like he's just like crushed and stuff. And they're all celebrating like, yeah, we took down our first Yonko. And then Kaido opens up his eyes again, and he's like, Whoa, Awakening mode. Now going back to the original question, right? Or the question that I mentioned about law uh, regarding whether or not he's going to sacrifice himself in Wano, okay? If you believe that law is going to die in Wano, right? Then this is my question. If law dies, who is going to get his double fruit after he passes? And I'm mainly asking this because each time Oda has decided to kill off a major character that had a Devil Fruit power, that Devil Fruit power is reused again by another person. We have the example of Ace. Ace's Devil Fruit went to Sabo. He inherited that will in the sense. And then Teach got Whitebeard's Devil Fruit power. That served to hype Teach up as one of the final villains of this story. So usually whenever Oda kills a character in the present that has a devil fruit, like Oda doesn't just like, you know, do away with that devil fruit. He brings it back. He likes to get creative with that. And so I cannot see like Law dying and then the Opi Opi no Mi never being used again. I don't think that's a possibility. Even Absalom, like his invisibility fruit, like went to Shiryu. So, you know, who is going to get Law's devil fruit? if you think he's going to die. I mean, Chopper can't get it because he already has a Devil Fruit power. And remember, both Drake's father and Corazon say that in order to use the Opi Opi no Mi to its full potential, the user should be a doctor because it's not enough just to eat the fruit. You also have to have some type of medical knowledge as well to pair it up with the fruit. And again, it can't be Chopper, so who's left? Kaya, I guess? She's studying to become a doctor? I mean, I could see her getting it by the end of the series, but not right now. I also thought about Dr. Kureha possibly getting it, but I think she's kind of like, sort of like removed from all the action. So I don't know if that would work out. And then I also thought about Vegapunk getting the Opi Opi no Mi as well. Now, I don't think that Dr. Vegapunk has a devil fruit power because if you remember, I think Kobe said that he was like, he discovered the properties of sea stone. So if he was a devil fruit user, like it wouldn't make a lot of sense for him working or experimenting with sea stone because that would just drain him constantly. So I don't think he has a devil fruit power yet. However, if he gets the Opi Opi no Mi, I think that would just make him 
like super broken because he's already like a super genius. He's the top scientific mind in the One Piece world. So if he gets the Opi Opi no Mi, that would just make him way too overpowered. Another possibility is that since Corazon was a Marine that was taken in by Sengoku, before dying, Law could tell Drake to give his fruit to Sengoku for safekeeping. And then maybe Emu shows up and steals it from Sengoku. Now the reason for why Emu would want to get the Opi Opi no Mi is because Doflamingo says that the immortality granted by Law's fruit can be used in combination with the national treasure of Marajoa to rule the world. I've said this before, but one of the best theories out there is that the national treasure of Marajoa is a devil fruit tree. And so if you become immortal, you can just eat as many fruits as you want without dying. And so you would have all different types of powers and abilities. So maybe Emu gets it, forces somebody to perform the surgery on him or her, and then Emu just starts eating a bunch of devil fruits. Now if that doesn't happen, but Law still tells Drake to give his devil fruit to Sengoku, then the only two people I can think of that might end up eating the Opi Opi no Mi would be either Kobe or Tashiki. Those are the only two characters that I think are relevant enough in the story to merit Law's power. And I think both of them are members of S.W.O.R.D., so that would work out. My money's on Kobe eating it, though, because if he's going to be Fleet Admiral by the end of the series, he's going to need a broken Devil Fruit power to go with the position. And he's already kind of Luffy's ally anyway, kind of like Law is. The only problem is that Kobe doesn't have any medical knowledge that we know of but he does have a lot of heart. Also, like, Helmeppo has these blades that he uses, so if Helmeppo ever dies, like, those blades can go to Kobe, and then Kobe can use them to sort of cut things with his Opi Opi no Mi, the same way that Law does. Also, surprisingly, Law and Kobe have already met. Uh, we just haven't seen it in the manga. If you remember, Law was in charge of an incident called the Rocky Port Incident. And Kobe was involved in that incident as well because he was there protecting civilians. So it would be cool to get a flashback of that moment where Law is thinking back on meeting Kobe. And then it turns out that Law actually got to know Kobe a little bit during the time skip. And he actually thought, wow, this, this Marine guy is actually not that bad. So just like with the Rocks flashback, I definitely think that Oda is hiding that Rocky Port incident flashback for a reason. And maybe it's because he planned Law's sacrifice since way back then, right? When, when he met Kobe. So, you know, it could be interesting to see that. Uh, regardless, though, whether Law sacrifices himself or not, I think it's obvious that he's a character that will live on forever. Remember, one of the main themes of the series is that you only really die if people forget you, right? So if Law dies taking down Kaido and saving Luffy, like, that that essentially immortalizes him. Not, not just in, like, the world of One Piece, but for the fans. Another reason for why I, I don't know, or I, I may not see it likely that he dies, is because in Dress Rosa, when Law is talking to Sengoku, Sengoku tells him something like, you know, it's kind of funny or it's, it's ironic that the only person I can share the memory of Corazon with is you, Law. It's another pirate. So if Law dies, then, you know, there's nobody else that Sengoku can share that memory of Rocinante with. So it's going to be interesting to see how things develop and how those things kind of like mesh together, ultimately to push Luffy forward on his road to Laugh Tale. Let me know what you thought about the points that I brought up. What do you think is gonna happen to Law? Again, if you think he's going to die, please let me know who you think will get the Opi Opi no Mi if that happens. I really worked hard on this video, so if you could show your support on it by like giving it a thumbs up, uh, I would really appreciate that. Thanks a ton for all of your support. I wish all of you the best. Take care, stay safe, catch you guys later. Bye.